Hey there. Hi. Um, I've got to tell you, it is so brilliant to be away from England right now. Um, if you could imagine the shit show that's Brexit <laughs> and the fact that these guys haven't got a fucking clue what they're doing and we're about to make the worst mistake that has happened for probably 50 years. And the energy of the... I've been sitting at the back and everywhere the last two days has been just uh, brilliant. Uh, England doesn't feel like this right now. It feels like we're going into reverse and it's really frightening. But I have to say, what I've felt in the last two days has been completely brilliant. So, number one, thank you for inviting me. Um, and secondly, um, it's great to be here. I did a, a couple of speeches um, some years ago in Tallinn and in Parnu. So I have some set sense of, of Estonia, but not a great deal. Um, just from, <laughs> from my point of view, there's a few things I want to talk about, and I'm going to ramble through it, okay? I'm going to give you almost no theory, because the theory is a bit boring and I'm going to tell you some of the things where I've made some fantastic mistakes and hopefully a couple of really good things. Um, where it's gone badly, it's gone spectacularly badly. And you know when you hear people on stage say, oh, no, it's really important to fail, okay? It's horrible when you fail, but you do learn quite a lot of stuff from it, but it's really quite devastating, and I have never found it particularly easy. Now, I've called this creativity starts with strategy and ends with the execution. Um, how hard can it be? Um, I say how hard can it be because marketing is not, marketing and marketing the creative economy is not hugely complicated. You have to basically have really good judgment and you have to really trust yourself because there's a difference between the marketing and, and, and the creative economy to if you're marketing this. This has absolutely no meaning whatsoever. It's just water, but it's got a brand called Aquavil. Now, whoever makes Aquavil wants you to feel emotions towards it, wants you to feel something about it. The truth is, in the businesses that I have worked in, they are things that are either important, they matter, or they already have meaning. And the last 25 years of my life, I've spent in a combination of <clears throat> working for the Guardian newspaper, which is, an, some of you, are you familiar with the Guardian newspaper? It's a fantastic bastion of liberal sensibility that is there, hopefully, to exist forever because it is one of the few newspapers in a troubling world right now that talks a lot of sense. Secondly, I then went to the Tate in the UK, the, the UK's largest um, gallery and most important modern art gallery and historic art. And then about five years ago, I went to Christie's The Auction House, the world's leading auction house. And I will touch on some of that. You will have heard of some of the stuff they've sold. And I left Christie's in August, and I am starting a new job in March. So I have had what is euphemistically known as six months gardening leave, which is completely fantastic. Because the guys you're leaving pay you not to work because they know you're going to work for a competitor. So I've had six months of loveliness, which is why I've thought about some of the things I want to talk about. And why it's how hard can it can be? Because many years ago, I was at a conference like this um, in, in Edinburgh in England. It was nothing like as good as this. In fact, it was really boring. And the editor of The Guardian and myself um, decided not to go to many of the events, even though we were the sponsoring of it, because we couldn't really be bothered. And it was in Edinburgh, and it was a hotel. It was a Sheraton Hotel in Edinburgh. If you stay at the Sheraton, on the top floor, there's an outdoor jacuzzi. Okay? He and I spent almost the entire conference sat in the jacuzzi, looking down at the de delegates, thinking, hmm, this is really hard. We're having a really hard time. So that's why I've called it How Hard Can It Be? This is my favorite ever teacher at school, okay? He's called Nigel Yates, and he would be so embarrassed if he knew that I'd put a picture of him. Now, the reason I put him up for here is when I was 16, 17, he instilled me with the confidence to believe in the stuff that I was doing. And to believe, maybe overstating it, but if you think you're right, you probably are. And I have stuck with that all my life. It does mean you make some mistakes, but it gives you a sense of conviction and strength to make a decision. Because it's really hard making decisions, and it's really hard to get a strategy, and it's really hard to see it through the execution. And someone in that process needs to have real fortitude to keep it together. And bizarrely, it was a geography teacher at school who taught me that. And the one thing he said to me, he said many things, one of the silly things I remember, he said to me, when you're older, I can see what sort of guy you're going to be. You're going to get all sorts of fancy dinner parties, okay? 
And when you go to these fancy dinner parties, people at the end of it will say, how would you like your coffee? Now, if you want it with milk and lots of sugar, just say you want it with milk and lots of sugar, even if it's not cool, because it clearly isn't. And I've sort of stuck with that philosophy for all my life. Now, this is the only theory slide, okay? Making the journey from A to B really is not as easy as it looks. And the only, uh, my point here is I'm trying to get from A to B in any business problem, okay? But the smallest error I make, and they're the little X's, mean you end up in some pretty wild places that you never meant to be. And getting from A to B, from a piece of paper that has a strategy to an execution of your business, is that's full of minefields. And if you step on any of them, you end up in C, in D, and E, which is not where you want to go. And this is some, a chart that someone showed me about 28 years ago, and it's stuck with me forever. And it's the most important thing to remember, that you're trying to get from A to B. That doesn't mean that you don't take learning along the way. You do. But getting from A to B requires incredible resilience. And interesting, hearing some of the speakers yesterday, the resilience they showed was remarkable in getting from A to B in their business program. Again, cut through all the bullshit, cut through all the stuff. There's two questions, in my view, you need to answer when developing a strategy and getting it right from strategy to execution. The first is, there's only two of them, is what is the problem you're trying to solve? If you want to be really positive, say what's the opportunity you're trying to, you're trying to, you're trying to, 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 to get to. And the definition of the problem is so hard. The problem generally is, oh, I want to sell lots more of this, I want to buy lots more of that. That's not a definition of a problem. And people often don't spend nearly enough time defining the problem. Some of the best examples I heard yesterday um, from some of the startups was when they were clearly defining the problem of their business, and others was less so. And the second, possibly even more important, is who are you talking to? And there's been lots of this discussion over the last two days, so I'm not going to dwell on it, but again, it's not, if I, was talk, if I was trying to sell something, it wouldn't be to all of you, it might be to 20 of you. The guy earlier today, when he was talking about his pipeline stuff, I thought that was a very interesting area of Google AdWords and Google Choice of Words, which define the target audience. But the target audience is absolutely critical. So, that's the end of the theory. Do you know who this is? Yeah, Ricky Gervais, really funny guy. So Ricky Gervais, this is going back to 2006, he came to see me at the 2004, excuse me, at the Guardian newspaper, and said, "Mark, I have created a bunch of a new thing called a podcast." And I had no clue what a podcast was. This is a lot. This is a long. This is 13 years ago. And he said to me, "Mark, it is full of the word fuck, the word C, the word W, and I know that your newspaper, because it has the total freedom to print anything, will not edit any of it. Are you okay with that?" And I said to him, yeah, no, I'm totally cool with that. I think we should do it. So Ricky Gervais launched 12 podcasts, which was done through the Guardian's platform. Those podcasts, at the time, became the world's leading downloads. They were downloaded about 4 million times, which in those days, now it's nothing. In those days, it was extraordinary. And the reason I said yes is that my principle is that most of the time, I don't know what I'm doing. And when other people come to me with interesting stuff, you should always consider it. He's a really interesting guy who has really interesting ideas. I also have a, rule, have a rule that I don't spend all of my budget all of the time. I always keep about 10% of any budget that I have put aside for rainy days when people like him come along. And he came along, not only was it brilliant for him, but it was brilliant for The Guardian, because The Guardian newspaper at that point was feeling its way in the digital space. This gave them the confidence to really go for it. And within no time, The Guardian became one of the top 10 newspapers around the world from a digital perspective, and it remains that way now. So from this point on, digital became critical to newspapers. Now, this is a long time ago. Here's a brilliant mistake we made when you ask the wrong questions. So some of you, how many of you actually buy a printed newspaper now? Okay, I'm absolutely, oh, thank you, one. Okay, no one does. I, I do still on Saturdays and Sundays, but generally I don't. So try, if you can, imagine a world, imagine a world where newspapers, really printed newspapers on paper, were what everyone did and what everyone bought. Unbelievably, about in 2004, 2005, there became a, 
a, the size of the paper really matters, and the size of the paper is going to keep this business alive. Of course the size of the paper didn't matter. You know, should you go big, should you go small, should you go micro? It doesn't really matter. But at the time, we all obsessed with the possibility that if you shrink the bigger newspapers, more people will buy them. It seems, I know, it seems crazy now, but this is what we thought because we were asking the wrong question all the time, and we were too scared, compounded by the fact the amount of money that existed in the printed version was so huge compared to the opportunities in digital. We spent 100 million pounds on printing presses to print a unique size paper. 12 years later, that unique size paper doesn't exist anymore in that size, because we've gone straight to a tabloid format. It was a staggering mistake, that was not the best idea we had because we asked the wrong question. Now, about six years ago, I moved to a company called Christie's, which is the world's leading auction house. Some of you may be familiar with this painting. This is the Leonardo da Vinci painting, the Salvatore Mundi, that sold, in fact, for $450 million. Now, there are only about 20 Leonardo da Vinci paintings that we know of in the world. And we think there's only one left in private hands. And we know where that is. It's in a museum in Scotland. But this emerged um, about two years ago, potentially for sale. We came to Christie's. We had a look at it. We realized it was a Leonardo. It was a da Vinci. We would sell it. Now, a number of questions emerged from this. How are you going to do this? And what is the role of the marketing? And how are you going to sell this thing? This is a Leonardo. It's one of 20. We had little idea of what it would actually be worth. We, th we thought it would be somewhere between maybe 100, 150 million dollars, which seems a lot of money. As it was, it ended up going for 450 million dollars. And if you read about what happened, one of the reasons why it went for so much was the marketing campaign that went behind it. Now, you might think you don't need to do any marketing for something like this. And when it came through the door, I thought, no, you don't need to do that much. It'll sell very easily. Um, we did a lot, but what we actually did, we were obsessed with trying to persuade an institution to buy it. Museums are, buying, are, are being bought around the, are opening around the world. This would be a single object that will drive audiences to go to their museums. So the people we were targeting were museums and people who buy objects from museums. There are very few people in the world who can buy a $100 million painting, never mind a $450 million painting. So the targeting of this was very precise. We also toured it around the world. We took it to Hong Kong, San Francisco, to New York, and to London. And our obsession was we had to show that there were queues around the block to see it. Because if you're a museum or institution, you want nothing more than queues around the block, because that says the object is going to draw people in. These were the queues in Hong Kong. It doesn't show it so well. This was inside the building. This was on the ground floor. We're on the 24th floor in, in Hong Kong. It went outside the door, through the lift, and up the top. And as you went through the building, there were more and more people. That was key, and it was understanding the audience who might buy it. The next thing we did was the Rockefeller sale, which became the world's biggest single sale of a single, uh, of a single um, uh, collection which sold last year. It sold for around $850 million. Again, you might think, well, it's Rockefeller, everything will sell. Well, if you're in America, Rockefeller means everything. But the truth about the Rockefeller family is that they had tentacles around the world through their art, through charity. So nearly all of the marketing and all of the budget was spent on taking uh, Rockefeller around the world. Because we knew in America the name Rockefeller was enough. You didn't have to do anything more than that. So we spent all our money in China, all our money in Hong Kong, and coming back through Europe that way, and spend remarkably little in America, which maybe is counterintuitive, but it had a significant role to play. Because in each of these parts of the world, the Rockefeller family had a unique story to tell. A lot of people here have talked about stories and storytelling. This was part of that. And these are just some of the pictures of that time. That was the last sale at 4 o'clock in the morning after four days when we sold the last object. And here's my last point, okay, when it comes to, to creativity, strategy, and developing it. Um, I've worked for some real difficult people and some really brilliant people, and I'm sure you're the same, whether you're doing now or what you're moving to. The key is to only work with and for people who allow you to be who you are and allow you to do the thing that you've employed to be. 
And there are three, for me, who have shaped my life and my work life. The first one, not in, not in order, this is Nick Sorota. Nick Sorota runs the Tate in Britain. This is Alan Rusbridger. Alan Rusbridger is the editor, was the editor of the Guardian newspaper. And this uh, was Carolyn McCall, is Carolyn McCall, who used to work at the Guardian and now works, she worked at EasyJet and then at ITV, and she's at ITV. The critical thing about the three of those people is that once they knew you were up to the job, they just let you get on with it. So you just have to let people get on with it, or else you're never going to get from A to B in any sensible way. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Do we have any questions in the audience? I might have a little chat with you up there. Something close to my heart. I like the way you were, I want to focus on understanding how the people will consume your art because that may be different to what you expect. And especially with the painting, I was, the, the Leonardo da Vinci, I'm like, yep. someone's going to buy a painting. What do you want? Yep. Hey, it's, what am I going to put around a Facebook ad? Yep. Do you want to buy this yeah. for 150 yeah. million? Yeah. And the identification mm. that it was the galleries mm. yep. that you needed to show that interest there, was that an obvious step to understand that? Or what was that process for you to work that out? Initially, I was of the view that, hey, it's a Leonardo. What, You're right. This is, this is straightforward. And then as we discussed it more and more, you realize how few people in the world have, I and mean, there's about 1,000 people in the world who buy art at this price. Right, okay, okay makes sense. Now, you can discount a bunch of them because they're not, we knew they're not interested in this stuff. And then it became, okay, if you want to draw the institutions in, it was, it, was, it, it was not an immediate thought. It did come through conversation, through dialogue internally, that that might be the answer. And in the end, that's what happened. And for those of you who follow this story, this painting will, be, will emerge in the new Louvre in Abu Dhabi at some point in the next year. So the story played out that way. Okay, and were you not only looking for institutions? Okay, so it's sold to Abu Dhabi, is that... Well, it'll end up in Abu Dhabi. It'll end up, okay, right. I was going to say, are you then focusing on emerging markets where maybe China, maybe the Middle East, where those... It, when, when, you're, when, when you're selling art, it's follow the money. If you know anything about art, in the 80s it was Japan. They've got no money now. They're now a selling country. So people who bought all the impressionist art in Japan in the 80s, they're now selling it. Then it became Russia. They've got no money now. They've spent it all. Now it's moved to China. They've got all the money now. So the big money is in China. Now, all that happens is that p selling companies, selling pe people who bought, then become sellers. So all the, okay, so yeah. the Russians will sell, and eventually the Chinese will sell. Now the Arabs are buying and selling. So it's an entirely circular world because it's a limited supply of beautiful objects. Yeah, that's so interesting as well. You can't make more of those. In, in, your, in this form of art, maybe the fashion designers will speak to later on. We have a gentleman who's from, from Ikea coming up there. You can make more of that. That can be produced. But you're working with a finite quantity and technically a finite number of buyers in the world. You are. And there are some instances where you don't actually want that group to buy that piece of work. Ah, tell me, what is that? Tell me, what, what, is, what do you mean? Well, if you ever walk into a gallery and go in with lots of cash, okay, never mind auction worlds, because auction world is free to all, but sometimes a gallery won't sell it to you because they might think, that you're the wrong sort of person to own that artwork. Because if you are the wrong sort of person, maybe the value of that art will diminish. Uh, okay. So, all right, so would, would a too obvious example might be that if the, a painting ended up in the hands of, let's say, a, a dictator around the world yeah. that wasn't yeah. you know, uh, yeah. on our good terms, yeah. that yeah. that might lower its value, it's formally from someone, someone's or palace. It could, or it could massively increase its value. <laughs> Assuming the artwork was got in the appropriate way and wasn't stolen or looted, right. if it's owned by someone you know, entirely inappropriate, that could also send it through the stratosphere. Okay. Maybe we've got the picture of the art. American soldiers uh, taking over the place and legitimately taking the artwork out. We've got some iconic photo. And later as long on as it's legitimate, as long as it's not so stolen, it's good. It's all legitimate. Don't worry about <laughs> it. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll just quickly throw out, did anyone have a question for Mark before we roll out here? All good. No worries at all. Here's a bag for Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Cheers. sir. Thank you. Cheers. Sir.